Thank you for joining me for another episode of Wake and Empower TV. I'm your host, Ethan Fox. Today I'm joined by Intuitive Channel, We Take a Cool Off, and we had an opportunity to speak about her life experiences and her early childhood contact with extraterrestrial consciousness and how that evolved into the work that she's doing today. We also had a chance to speak with the consciousness that she channels that goes by the name of Arjun which is a hybrid version of our human race. And we spoke about the collective consciousness of the planet now and where we're headed, as well as ancient civilizations, a lot of very fascinating topics. I also want to mention that we have our Awaken Empowered Expo coming up here in Detroit at the Doubletree Hilton on November 10th, 11th, and 12th of 2017. A lot of very fascinating speakers. We haven't announced all of them yet, but you can buy your tickets at a discount right now at awakenempoweredexpo.com and uh, tickets will be at a discount until the end of June. So join us for that if you can. We'd love to have you. So I'd like to now introduce my special guest for today, Weetika Kulaf. Hello, Weetika. Welcome to Awaken Empower TV. It's really nice to have you with me today and I'm looking forward to speaking with you about a lot of very interesting topics. Now, where are you calling from today? Hi, Ethan. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm so honored. Um, I'm in Amsterdam at this moment, which is where I live. Well, I'd like to start today by speaking about your background and really where all of this started for you. You have a very different, unusual life these days as a channel. And, uh, and I'd like to hear about your childhood, any kind of education you might have had along the way, and, and how that led to the life that you're living now. Wow, that's quite a story (laughs) in itself. Um, My childhood in general, I was raised by a single mom, but uh, during my teenage years, say around 14, I moved to my dad and my stepmom, and I left the house real early, around 17. Um, My early childhood, so I was with my mom and my sister. Um, I was the one who always had the weird dreams. (laughs) So that's kind of where the... The thing that I'm that I've turned into my profession and into my life now, where it already started. Um, so I had really vivid dreams, and later on I realized they understood much more about this and understood they were visitations. Um, I didn't really know what was going on back then. Um, my father actually worked for the Roman Catholic Church. He was a pastor, and um, he was really um, always very um, how do you say that? Uh, motivative to uh, explore your mind and explore life and to look at things from different angles. So um, by the time I was 16 and I lived at his place uh, with him and my stepmother and half brother and half sister, I was reading books from his bookshelf, uh, Nietzsche, Jung, um, Hermann Hesse. So I really, I was very fortunate, I think, with, um, say, the material that was there for me to explore uh, beyond the boundaries of what we learn in school, what we um, generally are being raised to believe is out there. Nevertheless, my experiences that I had personally and the things that I saw in my room, I really kept it to myself because even towards my father, uh, I felt it was too weird. <laughs> so um, most of my life, I was pretty quiet about this. Um, I went to school like any other normal kid, I guess, in the Netherlands. And um, after uh, I finished, I think you call it high school, I did um, a short education, actually learning window dressing. (laughs) Um, And then I did art school, book illustrational um, arts. So that was more or less in a very short <laughs> uh, way of describing my childhood, my teenage years, and my education. Now, you had some awakenings or some experiences right around age three. Tell me what those were like and uh, in as much detail as you can. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I might have been around three. I might have even been younger. So right now I'm pinpointing it at three because... Um, as much as the setting is concerned, I remember um, these things usually happened at night. Uh, so I would be in my bedroom uh, by myself and I remember being in this kind of bed that has the, um, 
how do you call them, the bars, so the kid won't climb out of the bed and start wandering through the house, you know. Um, and I think these kind of beds is what you have when you are about two and a half, two years old. So I was in one of those, I remember standing up straight in them and holding the bars and looking through them and being completely, um, well, frozen with stunnedness, I guess, um, because of the things that were happening in my room. So one of the first visitations I had was really um, impressive and I can see now, and with hindsight, I can see um, how I created or co-created that with the beings who visited me because I guess I wanted to wake up early in life and become aware of what was going on and remember that I had signed up, in a sense, on a higher level for being a part of this program, for being a part of um, what we now understand to be the hybridization project, but also perhaps to become a messenger. I don't know if that was like part of something that you could sign up for before you come into this physical life, but I do believe it's an option. And um, I'm very convinced that I had the wish from my own heart to be very aware very young, so I could learn a lot in a short time. So you could say that these early visitations truly shook me to the core and that's what woke me up and made me realize that the world I saw outside, the everyday thing, wasn't all that there is. So uh, one of these first visitations, the beings would come straight through the wall (laughs) and into my room. And the funny thing is, at least now it's funny, back then I found it kind of scary. They were really noisy doing that. So there was a huge amount of audio involved and they literally kind of broke through the walls. And that sounds really dramatic compared to some of the stories that we hear from other people who have had visitations um, because they usually kind of just float in. <laughs> Um, but it was only the one first time that it happened like that and this was the part of the wake-up call as I understand it now. So um, it really shook me and I was so surprised. Um, And these beings looked partially human, partially machines. That was kind of scary in that sense as well. Um, Later they often, more often dressed up, I call it, like animals. They would kind of warp into an animal shape. And for the longest of time, I thought I was seeing some kind of spirit guide animals or something coming to visit me and, um, well, take me somewhere else because um, there would be a part where I made eye contact with them and then I would forget everything that was in the real world. Like I would forget my bed and where I was, my room, um, and then basically end up somewhere else. And sometimes I would... Um, hang on to the memories of these kind of um, visitations that I was <laughs> kind of making to them, you could say, because I, I know I was visiting somewhere else, and um, sometimes I wouldn't remember. But um, what stood out to me was that throughout my childhood, I had this huge inner knowing, this really great awareness of things being in alignment with love or out of alignment with love and also the structure of our our society and the way children are being taught in school I could very easily pick out the fear-based beliefs and um, that bothered me a lot as a child I felt really not so at home in this world and it surprised me that adults were teaching us like my teacher was teaching me things that I felt could not possibly be right. Um, we're very fear-based beliefs. Like you have to grow up, and then you 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 have to. Of course, you grow up, but you have to do this, and you have to do that, and then you have to earn money, and you you choose one profession, and this is what you will do the rest of your life. And it all felt so incredibly uh, boxed in, and so um, almost paranoia, because. <laughs> because I had this feeling like there's so much more, and there are other worlds, and you can be anything you want to be and it's just important that you feel who you are and in any given moment follow your heart. So I had this really great knowing of that Um, and that made me stand out towards the rest of the kids as well I guess a little bit because I was teased and other you know and then I had this like single mom and we were that was an exception back in those days uh, to have your parents be divorced. So 
what is beautiful about all of this, because I really look at all of this as an enormous gift, it looks like, uh, to me, like I was in uh, high school really young. <laughs> I chose a university education really young because it taught me to observe very um, well aware the masses, family situations. Nothing is just random to me. It still isn't. Everything is really highly interesting in this world. I, I look at it with very different eyes in that sense. And I think a part of that, the foundation of that was laid by these kind of childhood experiences. Um, and around the age of 17, 18, the animals, <laughs> by the way, who changed colors, kind of sound all really weird maybe, but this is how I observed it. First they were kind of dark, and then they, they transformed to more um, like medium colors, like brown and dark red and then eventually they turned white and they became this really bright white animals. And so when I was around 17, 18, there was a moment where I had an out-of-body experience. I had these many times, by the way. So when I traveled with them, I felt like I was truly there. You have all your senses. You can almost touch, smell. It's very, very real. Um, and um, the animal... One of them <laughs> came as a white cat and jumped into the room where I was sleeping. And in the out-of-body experience, I was standing up in the room and I saw the cat jump in. And um, it warped in front of my eyes into a humanoid being, a really beautiful man, <laughs> and um, but very pale. And he looked at me and without speaking, I instantly understood in a telepathic download this has been us all along and then he disappeared and I realized wow okay and that was a really big step for me because then I realized it's not just some kind of spirit animals I knew it wasn't standard human what happened there but still I didn't speak with anybody about it <laughs> that didn't really happen until late in my 20s so and there was a lot of stuff in between but this is kind of the early part and I already almost forgot your initial question. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I have a, another question based on what you said earlier. So what do you think in our modern society, we are, uh, and especially people who are much older now, grew up in a world where we went to school and we stayed in the same job for the rest of our lives. And, and um, a lot of those older generations tend to be a bit judgmental, I find, of the younger generations nowadays who really don't have any, uh, have as much of a focus to one to do one thing, and and it's very common nowadays for people to do many things throughout their lives or to have multiple types of career paths or interests. What's your what's your um, opinion on on that? Um, my opinion is, I think. I have seen people in one job their whole life and shining in it, like amazing, beautiful people who were uh, like a shoemaker or they have been a lawyer their whole life and they loved it their whole life. I just feel that for me, when in school, my teacher told me basically as matter of factly, like this is what it's going to be like, what your life is going to be like. I felt this really big no coming up. No, it can't be that, can't be that way for me because... I didn't know why. That's the thing. I just felt this huge resistance to it. Um, I think things are changing. I think as a human race, we are evolving. And that the newer generations, just like you just pointed out, um, are more aware of the multidimensional beings that we really are. And whether that is conscious or subconscious, I think it is that part of our bigger whole that... Um, is so much more tangible right now, so much easier to tap into, um, which makes it completely understandable to me at least uh, to meet a person who is interested in 12 different things that all could be their own separate life careers and jobs. Um, and I can see younger people uh, combine these things and mix and match and come up with new careers in a sense that were never there. And it makes me so happy. It makes me so joyful because I think that's where we're going. 
there's no way in a sense that we can box or label each other the way we have done in the past unless of course somebody still wants to be in that kind of focused manner and feels that that is their highest excitement to do the one thing to the ultimate extreme and then that's it but then they will be very excited about doing that every day to wake up and they'll be those shining beings in their one profession and i think that can coexist but i think the mix and match generation is much bigger right now and yeah we see this uh, youth <laughs> that won't let themselves be pinned down and i think it's only a natural side effect of uh, our ascension really and so what you're saying then is that that's a sign of uh, human beings starting to tap into multidimensionality yeah in a sense so um multidimensionality can be looked at in many ways of course so you can become more aware of having simultaneous parallel incarnations and what in most people call past lives um, and realize that some of the energy there is very um, easy for you to tap into here and now and perhaps these people had entirely different professions and you still you can still feel a little bit of their enthusiasm so you may be enthusiastic about things that you never thought you would be enthusiastic about being in the profession that you're in but it makes total sense when you look at your cross connections energetically and i think the same happens for people that we now call star seeds who are more aware or awakened in the idea of our um, multidimensional connections to other dimensional beings that are on different planets in different universes um, and who knows what these beings are doing and how their energy is connecting cross connecting with yours so who knows maybe somebody feels a huge pull to come to go and discover a free energy device that works I don't know I'm just thinking out loud here that works in harmony with the resonance of several planets that are around us uh, who knows and then that kind of excitement that kind of curiosity may be supported by the cross connection of their own um well et counterparts in a sense <laughs> in my mind <laughs> he described at age three that these beings now they were initially they looked like animals but later on they became kind of part humanoid part robotic you said no, the very first ones, when I was really little, looked part humanoid, part robotic, and that was scary to me. I guess maybe they noticed that that was scary to me, because very quickly after that it became animals, and then it remained animals for a really long time, until I was in my late teens, like 17, 18, and then uh, the white cat turned into a man, and I knew, I realized later, um, that was the guy that I'm channeling now, so he is Yael. He is one of the hybrid races um, and it was his first introduction to me in a sense, really very obvious introduction and letting me know it's always been us. So that at least helped me remember or understand in that moment something is continuously happening and it's not actually animal, it's, <laughs> it's more humanoid. But I didn't think of ETs really until the age of 24. And, and so you've been participating in this hybrid project since you were very young. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what race was it that was, that was taking you to participate in this? So the first visitation I had with the type of robotic humanoid combination, the way I perceived it in that moment, uh, they must have been the grace because it's very much their energy um, in general. They, they were so strongly disconnected from their emotional parts that literally if you would um, so as a child when you observe these things and also as an adult it doesn't really matter but the way you get to see it is a translation of your rational mind of the energies that you're perceiving and you will get to see the picture that you're ready to perceive so that first picture was shocking to me, but at least it woke me up. So there was a co-creation there that I can see I agreed to on another level. And this is how the grace translated to me, partially robotic. And I can understand that now. I didn't understand it then, but I can see that now. And then with the animal shape, sometimes it was scary, sometimes it was not scary. So it was also, I have to add this perhaps, um, 
due to the divorce between my parents and my mom being single and having a pretty rough time actually uh, raising me and my sister alone um, there was a lot of fear in the house in a sense and I can also see how we are being raised in a certain way um, and how we pick our families I, I totally believe I picked my family I picked my parents uh, to learn from to grow from and I can see how this whole situation that was kind of unstable very much um, which also led to me leaving the house very young eventually um, gave me a huge learning um, aspect to understand people better later when I had sorted my own stuff out <laughs> much more and I worked on myself a lot in my life um, and I can see the gifts in all of that and this is how it hooks back to the visitations and the energy that are that is connected with those. Um, so the scary visitations are also a little bit of a reflection of the fears that you carry within yourself. So back then I could see um, the changing of the colors and the animals from darker to light. It was very literal a translation of the phases that I was moving through in my own life. And this is obviously what guides are for. No matter where they're from or what kind of beings they are, they will reflect to you what you need to see about yourself so you can learn and expand and progress through these um, encounters, is what I believe. Now, I, from what I understand, you at some point went back and rewrote the, the timeline of your childhood. Can you tell me about that? Yes. Um, so, uh, skipping forward again, that is... <laughs> When I was 23, um, I felt like I was going to burst, like everything that I had lived. And I wasn't so much a sharer of things that I felt insecure about or scared about. So I kept everything to myself. Um, so when I was 23, I went to a hypnotherapist uh, who helped me greatly understand myself and understand my dreams, which by then had become really really um tangible and realistic so i felt like i was either losing my mind or um i really really s sought help a neutral person outside of the family or friends uh, that i had because i felt i needed to talk and this man really helped me see the gift in everything and use uh, the information that was being shared with me by my guides so it was an amazing turning point and um, after understanding that better, um, also a UFO sighting <laughs> followed really rapidly after that, which is what brought the ET idea into my head. Um, and with being more at ease with the downloads that I received, I suddenly was open for a lot more information. And I started to understand how you can bend timelines and how you can, how you can actually shift to a better feeling one. So I just told you that... Um, I had a challenging t childhood, uh, but the main reason that I'm still sharing that story is purely because I transformed it. So that makes it a valuable um, thing to share. Uh, other people, if they want to, they can be inspired by that, for instance. Um, but I have rewritten my childhood in the sense that like, I never had a challenging childhood, you know? <laughs> it just made it um, great fun. and. But your rewriting, um, it doesn't work. It's not, it's not, in a sense, it's not a trick. It's not to just gloss over things uh, that are actually still hurting inside you. So I want to add that because otherwise people might misunderstand the idea. So to rewrite any timeline that has been painful to you, I guess, um, you want to first very honestly look at everything that happened and how it made you feel. Uh, go through that, integrate that, don't judge yourself, don't judge anybody else that was part of this co-creation, look at it from a distance, see the beauty in it, see how, how, no matter how crazy it may sound, but even the worst thing that ever happened to you may have just taught you that that is not what you prefer. So, and even that, just so as basic as that, is a lesson, is a gift. So, this is how I transformed really challenging stuff, um, that my family would say happened <laughs> and my friends would that spoke to me in the past but that I usually don't really speak about anymore because I really my mind never goes there anymore it's just a story so um yeah <laughs> and you can rewrite it any way you like after you've done the um, 
the integration part and some people call it shadow work. That is an essential step that you cannot skip. So I think so too. And then you can change it and you can actually literally feel in your physical being the evidence of your new timeline. I'd be really excited about it. <laughs> it's actually possible. Um, I'm living proof of it, but that's a whole different story in a sense to go into to the timeline things. But it's one of the things that I understand better um, because of the visitations, because of the contact with the extraterrestrials and the way they showed it to me. So what's the process you followed, though, to do that? Because uh, I would imagine, for example, if someone were to undergo a process of rewriting the timeline, they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily, I mean, do you still remember, you obviously still remember your childhood, right? But it, how is it that you experience it now that it didn't happen? Um, so I would already define that a little bit different than you just said. I still remember that childhood, not my childhood. So I can make it mine or I can make it that one. Because there is an infinite parallel amount of ver versions an infinite amount of parallel versions of me uh, stretching both ways, future and past. And I'm all creating it from the here and now is what I understand and what I really feel. So um, if I'm not talking about this, if I, if I don't underline it in any way, shape or form, then it's not there, really. Because we create it by our definition right here, right now. And when you think back of something and you feel bad because of it, you recreate it, including the bad feeling. So you keep carrying along with you all this negativity that isn't serving you. It has perhaps the way you um, dealt with a certain situation in the past may have served you back then, but nevertheless, it was very often a survival mechanism and um, you don't have to stay in survival mode. There is more than that. So that's what I had to learn. That's what I had to figure out. And once you, like I said before, you have to integrate it. You have to really... Find a place where you can love everything that your rational mind believes happened in the past uh, as we are being taught to believe that there is one past. But there is no such thing. And once you really, really love it, if you can accept it and be neutral about it, not get upset anymore, then you can really start rewriting. That sets you free to overwrite it with something that feels better. And it will ease everything because... You won't have any reason anymore to feel a grudge towards somebody or sad about something because there is only here and now and it will just help you to be more present, to be more in this moment, which is basically all there is anyway. <laughs> and so you did this through what, writing in a journal, was it? Yes, actually writing a journal was my um, outlet my whole childhood. I started writing at 11. Uh, I had a pile of journeys, <laughs> journals this big, um, and when I started rewriting everything, um, I took the whole pile, I worked through the whole thing, and I decided which parts I, I wanted to keep and which could go, and most of it went. <laughs> and then I rewrote parts, but the funny thing is, um, that didn't take a lot of writing at all. You could rewrite it just in a few pages. It sounds really funny, but if you just get your foundational beliefs in a way that they serve you, then you don't have to you don't have to go back to every single event that ever happened because most of the time there's one negative belief below a whole bunch of these events and all of them will be basically erased or become obsolete in a sense if you just find this neutral spot in yourself, this, this loving, peaceful spot in yourself concerning that one belief. So that can be very efficient. <laughs> now, I've had a lot of um, contactees and abductees on my show in the past, and as well as intuitive channels mm -hmm. who have all had some sort of contact experience in their lifetimes. And now, for the most part, I find that a lot of abductees in particular don't have a very positive opinion of being taken by the grace. So you seem to have a, a much different viewpoint on that. Can you explain why? I think part of that might be, it's crazy, but I really feel like I came into this life with an attitude, kind of sounding like, bring it on, just bring it on. And 
when I started working on myself, as you call it, um, and rewriting my past, I wanted to do it all, like everything. And still, I actually love doing it. It sounds <laughs> really crazy, but I love being completely um, open towards everything, just looking at it. Um, it gives me a really nice feeling even to feel, it sounds so weird maybe, <laughs> but when I'm going through my day and there's something out of sync, you know, when you feel inside, uh, something's not right here, I don't feel good, or I'm nervous about this, or I'm maybe a little sad about that, I will really make a note of that in my head, and when I get back home, sit down with it, and look at it, and see what it has to tell me, like what am I still believing about myself to be true, that is not in my highest good. Because that's what it is. Even the tiniest insecurity points to something bigger that is down below. Um, and it sounds crazy, but it can actually become fun <laughs> to do that kind of digging work. Uh, because I know what it feels like to transform afterwards when you find the thing that is bugging you to transform it into I mean, really literally laugh about it because it's so silly. It's never really true. It's never something... I made up for myself, it's usually something I adopted from society or friends or the world we're living in, and that isn't originally me. Um, so yeah, even with the visitations, I love, I love the childhood that I just described to you just as much as any of the new timelines that I wrote. So I don't feel cornered, I don't have to pick, but if I think back of my childhood now, I will think back of the best parts that are in it, or and in the best possible way, and that best possible way would be the rewriting part, to make it even bigger, to make it even better, because there was so much beauty between all these grey clouds, um, the silver lining, as you say, and if you just focus on the silver lining, before you know it, the whole sky is silver, <laughs> so it's just... It's more like that, and I really, really enjoy that. Yeah. Now, I've heard you say that the greys are us in the future. How far, do you know how far in the future that timeline was? No, and I'm pretty bad with numbers. <laughs> I'll tell you that right away. Like, all the downloads I get are very um, um, visual, um, but mathematics was never a thing that I was brilliant at at all. <laughs> so, um, and I, it was never really a big question of me either, this little part. I'm more focused on the emotional side. So, yeah, I, I can see how they were very disconnected from their heart, but so are many people right here, right now in this world. And my and the kick that, it, that I got out of that, basically, of witnessing that, is finding a place in me that can still love that, that can feel compassion for that. And understand like what a brave and courageous path of the soul that actually is to be in that place and I actually feel for the grace I actually I'm happy they they started the hybridization project I'm grateful for who they were and for globally what I see what I'm focusing on when uh, we're talking about uh, these visitations of the gray in particular um, these beings are offering us a chance to choose a different future for ourselves. There is no bigger gift in the world than that, and it comes from love. So no matter how maybe clumsy they were, and obviously unintended, but really hurt some people, I can see that. Um, and I use a lot of uh, Ho'oponopono, which is <laughs> an Hawaiian mantra to reverse negative to positive. When I hear these kind of stories, and I do feel for these people who have had these experiences, but I also admire them for their strength, for having experienced that and going through that. And I think on a higher level, we sign up for these impactful encounters to basically urge us to become the messengers that on a higher level we have decided to be. And the grace look out or search for these people or find these people that have it within themselves to overcome great sorrow and darkness and for that reason i see a lot of beauty in the whole project really uh, i think i've heard you say that about one third of the population of the planet has been in the hybridization project in some way or another right 
Oh yeah, that was not me, that was my guy. <laughs> he says that. I don't know if you could verify that. Yes, in one way or another, he says it's about, it's a little less, but it's about a third of humanity, which is amazing. I'm stunned by that information as well. But not all of these people are apparently, um, uh, how do you say that, Contribution, contributing on a DNA level. So it can be energetic, it can be super subtle, but some way or another, we're pretty involved, it seems. <laughs> yeah. And um, so how do the greys choose this one third? Is there a particular reason they chose certain individuals, not others? What I understand from that, uh, mainly in the beginning, I don't know how it is right now, but in the beginning it was very much based on the, um, how do you call that, genetic family lines, the seeds, you could say, of those beings who actually eventually became the grace in the future, um, so that it would be easier for them to do genetic alterations, because in a sense they were family already. So there's a very logical and practical reason for that. Um, but there's also a lot of beings right now, human beings, that are incarnating with a really big lot of interstellar um, energy flowing through their system and they just wanted to be a part of the program for that reason because they're helping their own family on the other side from another point of view so there's so many things going on so i don't think you can pinpoint it in in one reason but this one practical one i actually understood that from my guide in the beginning that that's kind of how it began and so you channel an individual by the name of arjun Right. Well, that's not his name, but that's the username. <laughs> yes. The name that he gave you so that you can you would understand. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and this is one of the hybrid lines or future timelines that is a result of the hybridization project. Yes, he is a member of the fifth hybrid race, which, in my understanding. Uh, together form the youngest hybrid race that has been created between us and the future human species that we now call the greys. Um, and the very youngest beings <laughs> are the hybrid children and they're being raised by the Yayel mainly, which is the fifth hybrid race. They're the Yayel, they call themselves the Yayel. So do all these different races exist in one timeline or are they all in five different timelines? Um, well, eventually everything is happening at once because there's only here and now. So all of these timelines are parallel to each other. Um, but of course, linearly looking at it, the first race came first and then the second one came second. But now, right now, they're all co coexisting. So to them, if I would ask Aryun, he tells me they're all working together. So that sounds to me like they're coexisting all at once and they're aware of it. So whereas we are, most of us anyway, are aware of a singular timeline and the past and the future being linear, they're actually multidimensional then and existing primarily their consciousness is multidimensional where they're aware of all the timelines. Yes. Yes. And they can focus into whatever timeline is relevant at any given moment. So now I don't really have that kind of mind that has questions about how many years ago was this or something like that. But I might ask or wonder about how does the pyramid of Giza really work or what was it built for? And when I get answers, he would just he would just jump there or you would just instantly go there and if it's appropriate to answer my question, by the way, because they cannot answer everything. <laughs> um, and then explain that to me in a like in an instant. And it's really um it's visual, it's like a little movie, and then there's like instant understanding of what was going on. So that's kind of how they speak. It's telepathic. They don't use words. Now, I've spoken with a number of different channels, and I find that the some can channel very technical things, and others channel very detail-oriented information, but could not channel anything technical or mechanical. Yes. Uh, you're visual. Is that because you're primarily your background and your mind has focused more on artistic visual types of things in your past? Yes, I came in very visual. Um, I chose to do book illustrational arts <clears throat> in art school because I couldn't choose, I literally felt like torn between 
of books and texts and literature and philosophy and all of that because I was constantly studying that for myself for fun um, and arts so I felt they, they kind of they somewhere they need to meet and in illustrational arts they do so also I never really called myself an illustrator I called myself a translator because I feel that um, my job back then when I was an illustrator which I did for years as a freelancer um, my job was to translate words into images and the fun thing is um, I could read a book and just see the entire movie in my head and now the reverse thing is happening my guides are sending me the movie and I'm translating it into words and so I feel like wow it's like my entire life I kind of practiced for this type of method of communicating with them which feels very natural to me and yes, some people, some channels, you're right, are very technical and then I'm, I'm amazed, like my jaw just drops. But also the questions um, that they answer are often questions that I wouldn't have. So it is, I think we get what, what clicks with our own system. Now, does Arjun and, uh, and that, his race, well, first of all, how is it that they came to be called that? Or would you even know that? Or is that something, is, is your mind able to understand that how, how they became how they called themselves or are you in the name no i mean uh, well the name of the race that you mentioned earlier how did they if they're a future timeline version of us how did it evolve into that particular name they're a future timeline version of us because they are cross well how do you say um crossed across with between us right here right now and um and the grace. So, um, as I understand it, they do have an ancient language. So, before they called themselves the Yayel, they were known by a lot of human beings as the Shalanaya. So, there was a name, and I guess on Earth, the way we live with our languages, uh, the way we express ourselves verbally, we can come in touch with many extraterrestrial energies, and we'll find a name for it that is close somehow energetically to the frequency of who they are. So we call um, the Arcturians from Arcturus, um, we, the Pleiadians from the Pleiades. So there is a kind of somehow um, hidden or buried under, bigger understanding of all of this within us. So I think this is all being co-created as we move along and we will find an overlapping reality wherein the word they use to introduce, introduce themselves and the words that have been invented on earth at some point meet and then it makes complete sense and that this is their name but they also they have a really deep understanding of who they are and they don't really need a name for it that's just our tool we're, we're calling them the yayal and they're introducing themselves as the yayal so that we have something to refer to because that's what we still need. We, we are still in this little box where everything needs to be labeled. Um, so in their world, they're not going around <laughs> with a Yael passport or something. <laughs> but so this is my understanding of it. So essentially, human, our, our way of communicating through words and spoken language, written language, is a lower form of communication, sounds like what you're saying? And what they're using is what, telepathic? Or what, what is yeah. their form of communication? Yeah, they are telepathic. Um, I don't think language is lower because one word can have a tremendous impact. Um, if you choose your words well and you, you speak from the heart, it will be felt by the other party, by the other person. Um, this is why I kind of I don't really like to, to, to compare in that sense, but... Of course, I do experience from my own life and from the communications that I have with them that telepathy is a much more efficient way of communication. It's really, really fast. <laughs> and um, it's all inclusive. So there is absolutely zero chance of a misunderstanding. If both people are telepathic and the one says something to the other and there's no way you can hide anything and for them there's no reason to hide anything. So you can see how we will be confronted with all of our fear-based beliefs of um, privacy and how things need to look like and you can't fake anything. Telepathy is completely 
right straight through <laughs> everything into the heart. So um, into the heart of the matter, whatever they're discussing. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating. But for now, I think yeah, language is what we have. But telepathy is is awakening amongst people. And also the, the words that they use, like the name Yayal, um, this just came up to me right now. It is based on their ancient language. So they did use some words in the beginning when they just basically came from the graves <laughs> uh, and their makers in a sense. Um, they did use an ancient language and all the hybrid races did in their beginning stages. And this language uh, was actually composed out of all kinds of elements both from the grey world as well as from our human world and that's why these, this ancient language actually exists out of little bits and pieces of many languages on our earth today. So there are sentences in their ancient language that you can trace back to as there's a word from France, there's a word from England, there's a word from Dutch or Germany. It's very funny, it's a total mix and then there's some completely new things as well. <laughs> But they played with it, they, they warped it into their own version, but very quickly they became fully telepathic. And what I understand of that, because this I asked my guide how they made the transfer transferal, because I'm curious about humanity, that's why I asked him, like, how did you make the jump from speech to a collective, open and transparent hive mind, in a sense? Um, and he said we had to become of a certain quantity, they needed an amount of beings and they had to overcome their own challenges because they did have some in the beginning stages of their own species. And when they felt really strongly anchored in their own hearts, then the foundation was laid for an open communication on that level as well. And then the language just dropped by the wayside because it was no longer needed. I think that's kind of how it might happen for us as well, <laughs> maybe in the future. If it's relevant, I don't know. <laughs> it would be fun, I think. So essentially you're saying that our inability to, as a, as a collective ray, a, a global civilization to connect to the heart is somehow connected to our um, reliance on spoken language versus, versus telepathy? Oh, wow, great question. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it's also where we are today. So we're in an ascension, we're in a continuing ascension, and we are becoming more aware of our heart connection and connecting to each other on a heart level. And I think that does open up um, for possible future timelines where telepathy becomes more, more in the forefront. But the whole thing the whole reason why we're still using language, we're also still needing it. We're also we're really still using it because it's still relevant for us, or at least for most people. And I think anything that is still relevant for an individual or a species will remain or stick around for as long as it is needed, as long as we can grow from it, as long as we can learn from it. And in a weird but beautiful way, the separation that we have created by using so many different languages also, um, is also an amazingly playing field to overcome the illusion of separation and rediscover, as we rediscover our own innate nature, our own essence, we can rediscover how to connect from that place to each other and then, surprise, you don't need language at all. So I think we're remembering that. So by yeah, getting more into your true nature self, we may actually evolve to a species that is also um, feels, knows <laughs> that they can tap into that bigger awareness in a conscious manner as well. Because Arjun actually told me, you can already do that, you just don't believe you can and that's why you're not experiencing it. It's not like we're incapable, really. We could actually do it. <laughs> So does our Yun actually have a physical form or does he just take physical form for your benefit so you can relate to him? He has a physical form and but okay, yes. He has but it's the last or okay, there comes all the labeling and the boxes again. <laughs> um, we're in an ascension. 
So you could say every single moment of our time, we're in a new parallel dimension. So I'm, I'm saying this because people speak of the third dimension, the fourth dimension, and then the fifth. But it's very boxed, it's very labeled, and very, very um, short-sighted, because there's a thousand million <laughs> dimensions in between, and basically every nanosecond is another dimension. And I'm saying that because they still have a physical form, they can experience themselves as being physical as much as can we, but the energy of it is entirely different. This is the fourth dimension that we're in, three dimensions of space and one of time. They're in the fifth. So the most amazing thing that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around now and then <laughs> um, is that even though they're physical, they can jump timelines constantly, intuitively, to wherever their consciousness is focused and wants to learn from. Also, their physical world is recognized as being them. So they can hold an object and are completely aware of that being a reflection of themselves. We don't look, or we're not raised, to look at our world like that at all. So with that amazing awareness of everything being actually a reflection, there comes a malleability where they can just streamline the focus into exactly where they're supposed to be, if you can say that. Um, and so when I speak to Arjun, he can actually be of one age in one moment and then of another age in the next, uh, or pick up one of his own childhood memories to explain a point to me, and then jump back to being an adult again. And I will actually feel the difference in his energy of being more childlike, being an adult. But it's always constantly with this same... A very strong um, confidence. <laughs> There's no doubt there at all. They're not doubting anything in the negative sense as we use the word doubt. Um, so that's that's just stunning to me. It still is. So yes, he has a body. <laughs> if he has the ability to project his consciousness into different dimensions, at will, is it possible for him to project himself into this dimension to where we would perceive him as physical or is his vibration at a higher fifth dimensional level, like you said earlier, and would not be something we would perceive with our five senses? Um, so his normal uh, frequency is a higher frequency. Yes, we would not perceive that. It's out of our range of our well, what we're used to at least. Some people can see him. I have seen him in out-of-body experiences. I haven't seen him in a totally random everyday mo mood, <laughs> just walking through my living room and then bumping into him or something. Um, also, when I asked him, like, would you do that? Would you show yourself like that? He said, um, we would only do that if, it's, if, it, if it is completely relevant for both parties, for, for them and for us. Um, but it is a lot of work. Uh, we cannot really imagine like how much work it is for them to actually become as physical as they can possibly get in our dimension, which will still be, he said, it will still be an overlapping um, in-between dimension. So if you do encounter uh, an ET being in, in what you think is a waking state, then afterwards you will find yourself kind of dizzy or out of this world and realize that what just happened actually took place in an overlapping dimension. So they may lift up or well, no, actually, um, I'm going to have to rephrase that. You may choose, maybe on an unconscious level, maybe on a conscious level, you may choose to raise your frequency to meet theirs and in return they will lower theirs to meet yours. And then in that overlap you can meet. And it may still look as if it's in your living room, <laughs> but that's just a duplicate living room that is there for the moment, so you won't feel too freaked out of being in a zone that you're not familiar with. So it's all a co-creation. These kind of encounters never happen by accident. So whatever way any person has experienced them was perfect for them, is what I believe. Like, are you a are you a conscious channel or or are you in a trance state when you channel? Um, I get pretty spaced out, but I can hear what I'm saying. 
some conscious channel, yes. But my focus is very much, um, well, I kind of synchronize with Arjun's energy. And they're so in the here and now that by the end of the sentence, I can forget what, what was the beginning of the sentence. Um, when I do a longer channeling or when I facilitate a longer channeling for people, often I will know the end of it. And then I already forgot the beginning completely, but I can trace it back. It's kind of like training yourself to remember a dream. It really feels like that. So I kind of, when I want to, I can really be focused to remember this dream. <laughs> uh, but I don't have to. And it would be a lot of work to do that for all channelings. It's not necessary. <laughs> for me, it's just fun to be in their energy. Um, and if that also supports other people, that's just a beautiful side effect. <laughs> and during our conversation so far, are you at times channeling or, or are we pretty much just having a conversation, you and me? It's very much you and me, but I can actually, it's funny because I'm so much talking about him, I can feel him present. So um, when I'm um, attempting to explain certain, uh, how do you call that, very metaphysical um, perspectives to you, uh, I do kind of feel like I'm tuning in there and then coming back, but not too much because I would completely lose track of this entire interview. But I can feel the presence is here. Did you feel it? Uh, I was not paying attention to that, so no, I was, <laughs> but I was curious. Well, yeah, so I don't know if you would call that like a little bit of me and a little bit of Arjun, but um, this is the thing. When you're asking that, I think it's really um, time for for people, when we're talking about channeling, to demystify that a little bit. And the more we tune into our own um, higher selves, we will automatically pull in information from wherever we need to get it from. So I can speak to any human being and all of a sudden they may just be channeling to me because they're saying exactly what I need to hear in that moment. And for all I know, that was one of my guides inspiring them to say that to me because I needed to hear that. And this has happened to me many times in my life and vice versa. I've been speaking to people that I did not know at all going like you this thing that just happened that is really important and I just had to tell you that and they're like whoa wake up call and these kind of random spontaneous things that I think most people have at least had one incident of in their lives we're all constantly channeling it's just that we we don't believe we are <laughs> so it needs to be labeled again it needs to be one one person who does that for a job but really, I think we can all be incredibly in tune and become an automatic flow of channeling our own personas in the highest, most loving way. Um, and that's what I understand uh, the Yael, their societies, is functioning like. It's all flowing. They don't, they don't wonder about things. It just happens. <laughs> and they trust in that. They choose to trust in whatever happens is what needs to happen in this moment. Um, yeah, there's only perfection. And I think we can be there. And I actually, I think we can be there now. You can look at life like that now. And you will always get what you need. So whatever answer you need for your question, you will get it. <laughs> um, and the other way around. <laughs> whatever I need to learn from people, I will get it if time is good, if the time is right for that. I believe. <laughs> Are you able to channel for me now or is that something you need some time to prepare? Uh, we could do a little channeling. It's very exciting. I, I wasn't necessarily prepared. <laughs> but that's okay if you want to. Um, um, I always begin with um, a little guided meditation. It's basically my way of connecting with Aryun. Um, I would say up to you to decide if you want to leave that in or not. Um, takes about three minutes or so. <clears throat> I just do that out loud because then I have the audio flow going. <laughs> and um, say that halfway is when Arjun kind of kicks in. Um, that's probably why I felt him hanging around because you were going to ask me this. I should have known. <laughs> it's so funny. So um, halfway the meditation, he kind of kicks in and um, 
they'll let you know like we're here or something and you can just take it anywhere. We are here, dear friends, and we thank you for the invitation of the co-creation of this moment in your time. How are you? Hello, thank you. Thank you for speaking with me today. Tell me to start, is there any kind of a message you'd like to share with um, our audience that they need to hear today? We are you. You are us. And by getting to know each other, we walk each other home to the bigger versions of ourselves. That would be a general introductionary message that wanted to come through at this moment. Short but powerful, and perhaps in the rest of this dialogue, we may dive deeper into it. I asked a question earlier um, that I, maybe you can answer. From my understanding, your race communicates primarily telepathically, and our race currently primarily communicates through written and spoken language. What is the difference that, um, what will it require for us to move to a telepathic uh, communication system collectively? Is it, is it a heart-centered uh, connection that you have that we have not readily established as a collective yet? To retrace your question and get back to the beginning part of it, you stated that where you are in your planet right here, right now, you feel that verbal communication is still necessary and that is what you mostly lean upon. We would like to reflect back to you that that is not how we observe it. You are already way closer to the idea of what we call a telempathic connection than you think. When you are in a room with a person that you perhaps do not share the same language with. There are all kinds of things that can happen without speaking that will automatically have you understand the energy frequency of that being. What your empaths, as you call them today, often see, speak about is they tune into other people's frequencies or really what is happening is that they're matching these other people's frequencies and so they can feel it within their own what is going on over there seemingly is one of the examples of you as a race moving into more awareness of what you already are you are each other it's very easy in that sense for you to understand what's going on over there you don't really need language for that so you are primarily already telempathic, but you have painted that innate beingness over with the idea of needing language. And when you're being raised that way is what you start to believe and you basically turn off all those buttons that are within you slumbering that could be turned on again and you'd be telempathic in that sense consciously in a jiffy as you say. So you asked, have we acquired that state by a heart connection? Yes, we have chosen to cultivate it in that way. But understand that, for instance, the grace, as you understand that future timeline of yourselves to be, were intellectually very evolved, but very disconnected from their heart. Nonetheless, they had a strong telepathic communication <clears throat> amongst each other. So that tells you right there, it is not depending on the heart. You can have a mental, in that sense, network. Both options are available and we have chosen to base it on a strong harmony that is heart-based, yes. You can do so too. You can go in whatever direction you wish, whatever resonates most with you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you.
so if the grays are the future linear timeline of our race and they have now travel back in time to create uh, to create this hybrid program and produce other parallel races such as yourself is that future timeline of the grays that we evolve into does that still exist or has that changed in some way that timeline as you are referring to now still exists but is its own timeline the timeline that you are on right here right now is a parallel of it but already very different because understand they in their evolution did not have the visitations of themselves from the future you see because that is who they are so also again tracing back to the way you stated this they used to travel back looking at this linearly into your time frames in what you would now call the past this kind of visitation is not really happening anymore the hybridization project has taken a new turn after the realization of our race it was no longer needed for them to be involved you could say they had achieved their mission so when people now experience the idea of visitations by the beings that you know as the grace which are on their own timeline they are often in most cases cross-connecting to an experience that they had in the past and having that come to the surface in this here and now because this here and now is ready to match that memory this is happening for a lot of you Many people who are part of the project have had these kind of visitations, these kind of connections since they were very young. That is not uncommon at all, though usually these experiences have been forgotten. But as you are growing into the remembrance of the whole that you are, these puzzle pieces, if relevant, can come back to the timeline that you are in right here, right now, and resurface as what you call a memory, but can be experienced as a very here and now experience, as if it's happening right now. Nevertheless, that may be a memory coming back up, linearly speaking. So you were wondering if that timeline that the original grades were on has altered along the way during this project. Is that your question? Well, my question essentially is, in our now future linear timeline, do we still evolve into the greys or are we now evolving into your race or some other future? Already, first of all, it's not possible for you to turn into them exactly because you see that is another timeline. You are on a new timeline, you see. So... Physically, literally, it is not possible for you, as you see yourself today, to turn into them as you look at them from this point of view. That is not possible and that won't happen. But you could say that the energy frequency of the path that they were on is still at your availability. You can, as a human race, still choose whether you are aware of that or not, whether it is conscious or not, to match up with that energy and you will create a new timeline as everything is new in every human now that may synchronize with the path that they were on. It will never be exactly the same though. You see? Do you understand this? Yes. Okay, thank you. And so the times that we're in now, it appears that now a lot of the ancient prophecies and writings have pointed to this time as a pivotal point in, in an evolution of consciousness. Do you, um, do you perceive that to be true? Well, yes, you are in an acceleration. And as such, you can take it in many directions. Whatever way you wish to play with this more information is coming to the table and you can respond to that in different ways 
the way you respond to it determines what will be, well, let's say your next picture, your next experience, your next reflection of the energy frequency that you're sending out. So you're in a hole of mirrors that turns around, you could say in this example, and it's starting to turn faster. And it's going to be interesting to see who believes they are seeing what exactly. And this is what determines what direction you will move into and whether you will, for instance, synchronize more with the path of the grays as they have chosen to explore their physical reality. Or if you choose to walk more into the direction of the heart, where you live your joy, you follow your highest excitement, and eventually, perhaps, we may meet up on a overlapping reality, which will then be the main reality as you experience it in that moment. All of these parallel future realities exist, coexist, and are open for you to tap into, to materialize, to bring down to Earth, in whatever way you so wish. You see? So you perceive so you perceive us as a parallel reality or a parallel timeline as opposed to the past of your own lineage. You're in a parallel timeline every split second. We don't speak of the past the way you use that word. We see you coexisting with us right here, right now. That is why we are having this connection right here, right now. We're having this direct communication. So we're not looking back at anything. We can just see right here, right now, the way we perceive you at this moment. We can see the a range of options that is open for you. And when you ask about your ascension and this being a really highly interesting time, yes, it is because so many options are open for you. This is not common in general for a lot of species to have so many options, you could say. So right now you're at a crossroad and what you call your ascension is really the splitting prism where everybody decides what color, what light beam they wish to be a part of. That is really exciting and we are very joyfully interacting with all of you at this moment of your time, the way you create it. So if there are an infinite number of uh, dimensions being created and between where we are and where you are, which is somewhere in the fifth dimension, is it possible for you to describe in a way that we would understand what it will be like to to exist in primarily a fifth dimension versus how we perceive reality now? There are, of course, limitations as to how much we can share with you about this because we are truly looking from a very different point of view. Nevertheless, the idea of the energy that you are familiar with, that you call being in love, is our ground, you could say, the ground under our feet. That state is the general state of being. If there would be any lower frequency, you could say it would be neutrality. So, by the hand of examples, mentioning some emotions as you know them, as they are things you can relate to in this here and now, that may paint a little bit of a picture, but like was explained to you before, there is a much more overall picture of the way we observe our reality. It's much more malleable, much more fluid. And you may understand, as when you are in love, you forget time, you forget your agenda, you're with your head in the clouds, as you say. But on the other hand, you are incredibly focused. You're very focused on the frequency of love. You look through pink sunglasses and everything looks beautiful. It is easier for you to reach the mindset of compassion when you witness something that is not desired. It is easier for you to smile despite, as you would say, certain things that bring up resistance within you. It is that flow 
that you can, if you want to, cultivate more within yourself by following your excitement in every moment as much as you can to the best of your ability without any expectation of the outcome. With that free state of mind, of heart really, you will get to an energy frequency that matches much easier with ours. And once you're there, you may have some, well, slippery experiences where time doesn't seem to be what it used to be. Or objects are not as solid as they seemed before. And this is you stepping into our dimension, getting closer to it, one step after another, through your experiences, as you become more comfortable with the idea of having such experiences. Because if there's one thing that would keep it away from you, it would be fear of this. And that fear too, quote unquote, needs to be conquered before you can allow in these kind of individual shifts. And as any individual chooses to shift in a certain direction, they will automatically co-create from a higher level, you could say, the projection around them of the mass consensus that fits with their new state of being. Because all of this is co-created, all of this is a dance, and every single person on your planet is walking their own timeline, which in itself is not one timeline either. You are a wide compilation of different options and again this is why you are so highly interesting for so many of us to come and check in with you and see how you're doing and give you a little perhaps suggestion here and there that you can do it whatever you want however you want to use it does that help yes so if i'm understanding correctly any one of us at any given time can exist in the fifth dimension where you also primarily exist, even if the rest of our civilization was functioning in the third or fourth dimension? Well, yes, but then for that person, they would co-create for themselves with their surroundings a situation that would flow with that. And then again, because you love each other so much and because you wish to do these things often together, you don't want to leave anybody behind, you could say, in many cases. You could say that some people actually, whether it is conscious or subconscious, slow themselves down a little bit in their own ascension until their friends or family catch up. You see, that actually happens. You see, there are many belief systems in your world as to how this ascension process goes about, but you're all moving through it in your own way, in your own tempo. And all the way into fifth, literally being there full time, as you would say, is a state that is not yet, as for now, as we are observing it here and now, compatible with most of your society. So there are some beings on your planet, human beings, that are, well, let's say, holding the space for this to happen for more of you. They are there, they can shift into it very easily, but they are often living very much off the grid, as you would call it, in seclusion, certain gurus, certain teachers that are to most of you not even known at all, but may be known by some indigenous people, may be known through some legends, but yet are still alive. And with their presence on your planet are radiating and pulling up the frequency for the rest of you so that you can follow along in whatever tempo feel you feel fits you personally. You see, because fully in fifth, that's not yet so easy to access, to be there full time yet, for most of you. No judgment, just an observation. You understand? Yes. Do you, d does your race exist on some sort of a, what you perceive as a physical planet or is it some other kind of an experience that you, uh, that you live? We experience our planet as physical. We have land, plants, water, everything you have on your planet, you could say, only slightly different in the sense that we have different animals, different vegetation. The way we live with, in harmony with our planet, 
is pretty different from yours at the moment but you can choose to move there and many of your people are remembering their heart's connection to Gaia, your planet, your Earth and feel drawn into that direction to really co-create with her, be with her and live in harmony again. That's how we live with our planet. Yes, it is being experienced as physical by us. But we also understand the planet is a part of us, is us on another dimension. You see. Is your planet something that we would be able to perceive from our awareness or is it existing in another dimension? Not at this point, because with us, you could say the entire planet resonates on the fifth dimensional frequency, which, like we just said, is not that logically or scientifically the way you examine your Earth right here, right now, in this dimension. It won't be physical in that sense to you, most of you. But then there are, of course, those of you that visit us in either dream state, out of body experiences, or through now and then the journeying with certain plant medicines of your earth. There are cross connections where we can consciously communicate and where we have been showing pieces of our world to people on yours. So some of you are carrying around little images in their mind or their heart of our world. And in that sense, walking around with that, sharing that with other people, planting the seed of the energy that comes with our frequency on your Earth so that eventually we can meet. And yes, then our planet will be vis visible to you, even to those who call themselves the scientists by then. And they can come visit and examine it for themselves if they wish to. This is very funny for us right now. It seems to me that the... Uh, the linear timeline on earth in the past there were times when the civilizations that existed here were much more advanced and potentially may have even been telepathic is is that true have we for example the builders of the pyramids and the many ancient structures around the world that seem to have been built using some kind of knowledge and technology we don't currently possess. Was that a more advanced race than us? Well, what is advanced, really? Because you can look at this from many perspectives. Yes, they were often, some of them, much more evolved. But really, what it came down to, which is why they are not around anymore, as you say, what it came down to is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that knowledge, really? Because you can have amazing technology if you use it for goals that are not necessarily in everybody's best interest if you do not have at the foundation of that knowledge the understanding that what serves the one can serve the all and aim it in that direction then eventually it will well let's say universe will rebalance itself which is why these civilization, civilizations eventually did not survive, did not make it to your current timeline or disappeared in another way altogether. That would be a short explanation. But some of them were more telepathically connected than others. Yes. Are we moving toward a future in our human civilization where we will develop a lot of that understanding and because it seems like most of that knowledge has been lost to us? Lost, but not completely lost. It's still there for you to remember because what once was will always be and thus you can retrieve what is relevant for you here and now and use it in new ways, in new manners. Those who build the pyramids had a co-creational bond with some interstellar beings. There has been a lot of work put into noting down 
a lot of the understandings they had in that time. These transcripts are still on your planet and will eventually be rediscovered and shared with the world. It will highly help you understand your history as you look at it from this point and it will answer into more detail the question you just asked us but understand there are some things we cannot reveal to you because you have you could say signed up as a human race to reveal these things to yourselves in certain manners so this would be one does that help yes so these these previous civilizations did they exist in another dimension? Is it possible that the understanding or technologies that they employed are things that we could not really implement in our current development just simply because they're, they were existing in another dimension? No, they were physically on your planet in your dimension, as you mean it in this question. You could say, like we said before, very often this kind of knowledge was kept in small groups and hidden or kept away from the majority, which is not, again, the energy that will eventually truly propel you forward as a human race. <clears throat> you could say on a higher level you have decided to do it differently this time, at least a portion of your planet has, and you all have the chance to choose that new future where there is the open sharing of knowledge in that, in that manner. Those who did share amongst themselves, as a, as a... We're looking for the word. As a tribe, in this case, that did share knowledge altogether in that way, woke up in the dream that you are living in this dimension and simply left your planet altogether because they, as a tribe, were ready to leave. And this is us talking about the Mayas. You understand? So many storylines have been lived on your planet, and since they have been lived on your planet, the energy traces they left there throughout their own exploration of themselves can be tapped into by all of you, if you so desire. Same goes for those civilizations that were, well, still searching, still experimenting, both talking about or referring to at this time, to your Atlantean time, as well as, you could say, the future timeline of the graves. There are a lot of similarities and parallels between these two ways of exploring. So all of this information is here for you to play with in whatever way you like and by your experiences, by synchronicity, you will see if you are truly tuning into the path of your highest excitement or not, which is a beautiful never failing mechanism offered to you from unconditional love through your own higher selves. Is the future of the human civilization already pre-written? For example, are you able to look into the future and see a definite uh, future that we are moving toward or is it constantly changing in every moment based on our decisions? The latter. It is constantly changing based upon your decisions, but there are some things we can see that are, well, let's say, on an individual basis. You can have some momentum going in a certain direction, you understand this. For yourself, if you have had certain experiences that made you very angry and you have chosen to hold on to the anger, perhaps, then you will keep on seeing reflections of that specific situation in a way that does not really energetically serve you. So this is the beautiful mechanism that we just spoke about. 
we can see the momentum of certain timelines. We can see the blueprint of them. Now, some are more detailed than others, but eventually, we are speaking in general terms to you at this moment here and now, eventually it always comes down to each and every single one of you and the personal decisions you made, you make, and the belief systems you choose to propel and continue and recreate for yourself into the future as you see it. So, a little bit of both, we can see a little bit of both. So do we as individuals choose a particular life experience prior to incarnation uh, that is predestined to some degree or is our human lives individually entirely based on free will and we can change any aspect of it that we want? Here too, it is a little bit of both. You, as a soul, on the soul level, you often... Let's say you pick a theme that you come to explore on Earth. This can be, and often is, a very general theme. Nevertheless, it is, you could say, in that color that you will be perceiving and experiencing your life. But the way you fill it in, the way you bring it down to Earth, the way you add the details to the painting of your life, as it unfolds, it is entirely and completely up to you, and that is all because of what you call free will. So, to give an example, the idea of someone's theme being, perhaps, to remember that you can trust yourself. That can be the theme. Now, you can be born very poor, you can be born immensely rich. It doesn't really matter, because... Whoever you are, you might be playing with that specific theme in this our incarnation. But you also understand that many circumstances may assist you along that way. You may have people around you that tell you their truth and you may buy into it. But see that by playing that part of your life, you give yourself from a higher level the opportunity to remember through perhaps the resistance that this situation brings up in you, to remember that that is not who you really are. And then that situation, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, will have brought you closer to who you really are, and thus adds to the exploration of your theme. To understand and remember that you can truly trust yourself. That you can stand into your own light, that you can bri brightly shine in whatever way feels fit to you in any given moment, without thinking that you need to hurt anybody else or yourself for it. See? So, it's both. There is free will and there is, well, we would never call it predetermination, but there is a bit of a theme going, yes. From your perception of reality, do you uh, have a concept of uh, a source energy or a god that, well, as we refer to as a god in many religions here in our understanding, how do you, how do you perceive that? Well, there is the one, and that is what you could call god or source. And then there is the way the one discovers itself continuously, gets to know itself, rediscovers itself by the reflection of all that is which is what we are all a part of, what we are all made of, you, me, everything, everybody, and which we all also personally are. And that might sound a little bit complex, but you are, in that sense, God. We are God, all from our own perspective, as a part of all that is, but also being all that is simultaneously which is, in a sense, a coach, for lack of a better word, the mirror that is the split-off of the one. Do you understand this? Yes. Okay, thank you. From that standpoint, then, what is the purpose of, uh, of life? To be. To just be. 
the purpose, if you wish to use that word, of existence is to exist. Just to exist. And you can do that in any way you like. We recommend you do it by following your highest excitement, but you can choose to do it differently and we won't hold it against you. There is free will in that sense. You are who you are, you are unique, you are an unmissable puzzle piece of all that is. And there is no way you can be off your path because you are the path that you are living. You can't be lost. You're always exactly where you're supposed to be. And it is never too late to begin anew, to look at life in a new manner, to change direction. You are entirely free when it comes to that. And your exploration, the reason you came to Earth, is just to be, to the best of your ability, who you truly are. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less that simple, really. I've spoken with a lot of individuals and also other channels who who believe that or who have said that um, the reason that we have, as a civilization, descended into such a uh, more war-oriented, hostile, dark period is because of a low vibrational consciousness that has had influence over our civilization. Is that how you perceive it? No, that's not how we perceive it at all. Can you can you share what your uh, what your perception is? Well, in this case, it would be very helpful if we had the full story of your source at hand, so we could reflect to it in a more complete manner. But from the little bit that you have shared with us right here, right now, we can reflect back to you that we see you all as having chosen this incarnation from a free place, from love, from unconditional love and with the wish to explore your life on earth as being as much as you can possibly be, as true a version of yourself as you can possibly be in every given moment. The idea of another, perhaps you're gonna have to repeat that and clarify it a little bit, another consciousness of a lower frequency overruling the earth, what is it that you heard? Uh, that there was a reptilian consciousness that was in control of or influencing the consciousness of human, the human civilization. Okay, thank you. The idea of that energy that you call reptilian, in a sense, is within all of you. There is a reason why you have a reptilian brain. There is a reason why you have the freedom and possibility within you to choose the light and or the dark at any given moment. The reptilian energy, as is been referred to towards you in that specific manner, has been translated in a very not self-empowering manner to you in that sense. Because from a higher perspective, Everything is perfect, everything is divine and in its perfect place. And the reptilian frequency that is part of your own beingness is a part of the choice, the desire to transform to a certain, from a certain degree of darkness into a really high degree of light. Because you have all chosen that on a higher level, you have come into a world that has access to these kind of frequencies, or let us become more specific here, because this is important, had access to that amount of frequencies, because this is changing. What you call your ascension, you could say that pretty much by now, as a human race, you have more or less experienced or played with pretty much every kind of negativity that you could possibly play with. No wonder that you invited, you could say, all kinds of angles, 
into that game to truly make it very thorough is the way we would wish to word this now you have left most of that behind you and you could say that the threshold of stepping away from that heaviness was what you call generally put your December 2012. Now a lot of things have shifted in that year and month generally again because some people were energetically already there and others followed a little later but a lot of sh has shifted in that time and has opened the doors for a lot more higher frequencies to communicate with you in a much more direct manner as we are right here right now today so as long as people choose to judge the idea of reptilians we understand what you mean by that but really it is not serving you and you are judging a part of yourself because this has been a part of your past is a part physically even of your system and something that has highly served you in your exploration in your journey from this pitch deep dark black into the bright shining bright light so as you remember more of who you really are you will find that defining it in a manner of being overpowered by, which was truly never the case, is not serving you and is really an outdated kind of perception to this. This is what we would like to say about that in this moment. Does that clarify it a little for you? Yes. So are you saying then that the reptilian portion of our brain exists because we needed to or chose to tune into that aspect of ourselves at this time? Yes, in a way you could say that. And, and you it also shows you. shows you how integrated this part can be, for it is literally within you. Now the name reptile brain has been assigned to a certain part of your brain. That is also being seen or witnessed in reptiles on your earth, but has given your scientists, your biologists, a hint as to how this was connected. And literally, really, and it is no secret anymore, we would say there is some reptile DNA within your system, but it is there by choice and you can use it in your benefit. So you could say you have made your game a whole lot more exciting thanks to this element and therefore the reward of playing it in a way that serves you became much bigger, much brighter. You see. Is it reasonable to assume then that you don't have a reptilian portion of your brain? We are the cross connection again of your DNA and that of the greys, so yes, there still is some of that in us, but we see it in a balanced manner. We don't judge it and we understand that at any given moment, yes, we have the choice, as do you, at any moment to choose a lower frequency path, but we also understand, you could say, the bigger picture. We have experienced the differences very soon in our race's existence. We have learned how to tune in and to recognize how our behavior, our belief systems impact the reflections we receive back. And so logically reasoning, we have chosen to not do that because it doesn't serve us, which shows you, you can evolve with that part of your brain in a sense, in a manner that is harmonious. Nevertheless, it does physically look different. Our brain looks different from yours. But you could say that some of these elements are still there, but integrated fully, completely, lovingly, harmoniously, and in a balanced manner. You mentioned earlier that a certain number of human beings ascended prior to December 2012, and some have prior or some have since that time. What 
percentage of the human civilization globally has now evolved to a higher level? Well, ascension, as you just said it, is happening every sec second, every moment of your life. You are ascending as you are evolving. You're moving forward as you look at it linearly. So you're all ascending in your own way, in your own tempo, in your own direction, in your own preferred direction. So when we said December 2012 was a threshold, what we meant is that you, on a sub conscious collective level became, let's say, chose to become more easily aware of what we just told you before, that if you want to, you can leave that heavy darkness behind you, and we mean for good. Becoming aware of that, remembering that more easily, comes automatically with remembering your true own nature and seeing how what you believe is the propeller of what you experience in life. By remembering that, your own God creatorness, you can easily leave behind that idea of the need or the insistency of the darkness that was there before, because you're done with that game. 2012 was a threshold on that level and on many other levels, one of which is the opportunity for every single one of you, if it is a heartfelt wish, to communicate more openly with us. Because, well, you could say you were in a kind of self-imposed quarantine up until then, when it came to ET contact. And you are no more. So, right now, we are taking the cue from you, you could say, both conscious and subconsciously send out requests for more contact are being heard and noted, you could say, and used by us to determine where, when and how much we are allowed to interact with you, because there is no way we would ever wish to impose ourselves on you, and so we take our cue from you. There were, in that sense, as you stated your question, it would be hard to pinpoint a percentage of people that were ascended, as you just called it, because you're ascending continuously before 2012 or after. We can tell you that the amount of positive energy in general present on your planet before 2012, December, more or less, was a little less than half and then after was a little more than half. So looking at your yin-yang symbol, you could say that with the tiniest bit, the amount of white grew bigger or larger than the amount of black, which again is why we're telling you, you have entered a time frame, an era, wherein you can, if you want to, decide to fully focus on that white with a healthy integration of the darkness. Remember, the black dot in the white part will always still be there. Otherwise, there would be lack of balance. But you can experience that as much greater in your life than you could before. And that goes for all of you. That window has been opened for all of you around and about that time frame. Does that clarify it a little bit for you? Yes, uh, but if, uh, if, oh, if I'm understanding correctly, if a little bit more than half of the population of the world are moving in this, new, in this positive direction, why is it that we are observing that the majority of the mainstream conversation and population seem to be very much still rooted in a lower vibration and uh, in wars and and things that are of a uh, of a of a less of a darker nature yes good question thank you it is because we are not counting people we are measuring positive energy understand that one person with a really high frequency can 
well, let's say in this case, metaphorically speaking, outweigh thousands of other people. The amount of people needed on your planet to raise the consciousness for you as a whole has come to a certain, well, percentage or level where they could tip the scale and allow for their entire world to move in their footsteps if they so chose to do that. So the door has been opened by a little group, by a few, and therefore what you observe, as you just stated to us, can very well coexist in the midst of this shift actually happening, but it seems to be on the background. Now you have chosen, you could say, as a human race, subconsciously, to experience it in this manner, because it would assist you in your journey of becoming absolute masters of creation. You don't become a master by having somebody else fix everything for you and being it instantly obvious would be a little bit too easy. Looking at the game, the way you have chosen to play it, you are testing yourselves, each other, you are assisting each other and yourselves to grow into this, into this with a full awareness, a deep understanding and full recognition of the impact that every single human being has on the whole. So when you meet one of those, well, let's say torch bearers, one of those shining lights that is actually of such a high degree of positivity in comparison to what you perhaps observe on the news, as you call it, you will feel it in your heart, you will recognize it right away, and it may inspire you to do similar things, to live your life to the best of your ability, following your own highest excitement in whatever way it feels good to you in any given moment. But you see, the way this is unfolding is absolutely perfect, and to the rate that you observe within your own personal bandwidth, the amount of positivity that is there, it is to that rate that you're seeing a reflection of where you are yourself, more or less. You can take that as a guideline on your own personal journey. Because really, what's on the news is just the tiniest, tiniest fraction of everything else that is happening on your world. And truly, if you would check the records, you would see that. But we're speaking, of course, as in the lines of history as it is known to you today, as you've learned it in your schools. But there has never been this little war ever before. There has never been this much abundance on so many levels, so much health, so many solutions for disease. Now, of course, there is a lot of stuff that you're still fine-tuning on all of these levels, but you're getting there. Generally, you are doing really good. Nevertheless, of course, it is up to you, every single one of you individually, to focus in on this in any way you feel serves you best right here, right now. You see? Well, let me restate what you said just to make sure I understand. So what you're saying is that it isn't that 50% of the population of the world has moved to a higher consciousness or, um, uh, but there is, there are over 50% positivity yes. on the planet. And so those of us who may be of that higher consciousness, we have it in our power to use that to tip the scales forward. Yes. Forward. I see and to increase the momentum that this little group has already going for themselves. And you can tune into it much easier, much, much easier than you could before. Because there was actually a little bit of, well, leap that you had to take to get there. But not anymore. It is much more accessible. Energetically, it is. And if would you speak to any of your energy workers, you would get the feedback from them that things have truly changed tangible, visibly changed since around and about that date. There was a little bit of, well, let's say, free work done already for some people. This started 2010, 2009 already. But you could say you were preparing yourselves for making this jump and you did a really great job making it. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with me today. Thank you so much. 
We love you unconditionally and we have enjoyed this dance of question and answer immensely. We wish you a vibrant, joyful rest of your day. Namaste. So how was that for you? Do you remember a little of it or any of it? Uh, the last part, like typically. <laughs> Literally the last part. I have no clue where we began right now. I, I would have to sit down for it and really dig a little bit. And, and are you, when you go into this um, altered state to do the channeling and you come out of it, is your... Do you feel your vibration heightened or is there any residual sensation that lasts afterward? I feel kind of buzzy right now. Like I can literally feel my own energy field going, uh, making a pul pulsing um, movement. Um, and while I'm in it, I'm almost completely unaware of my body. Like it's just out of the way. There's no focus on my own system in that sense. Just very... Um, I guess you call it primarily, like, I do notice if, if I get like a, at some point like a pain in my back or I should kind of move a little bit to, to uh, alleviate my posture or, but most of the time I'm, I'm just like here. <laughs> it looks a little weird, but I always feel like when, when Arjun um, uh, merges or when we, when we sync up with each other, that would actually be the best description. When we synchronize our energies with each other, um, I move with my focus to the left, kind of fall to the left, or allow myself to fall away to the left, <laughs> and then he comes from the right, and and there's this very steady flow um, of them, <laughs> and I'm fascinated by everything that comes by, and just listening in, and they're really tuning in with you as well. Um, like when um, when you're asking a question, uh, they really want to make sure that you got it, and that's why they're like checking with you. Did you get this? And they're very very thorough with uh, people usually. And uh, how long have you been uh, doing the channeling? I didn't ask you that earlier. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, vocally, now it's been about two and a half years. Before that, I did automatic writing. My story, um, or oh, one of my stories, I should say, if, if we're talking about separate timelines and you can bend them, uh, one of my stories is that uh, it was quite a throat chakra journey for me. Um, there was a part of me being a child um, where in that timeline I didn't speak much. I was very shy to the outside world. Like I said, there was this one storyline where I was being teased in school and very like seclusive kind of on my own. I, I had no problem uh, amusing myself. I could, could make out games out of anything. But um, there wasn't too much interaction. I was kind of human shy or people shy. Um, and art school too. I kind of picked the arts because I thought, oh, then I can be in my own little world. I can create things and illustrational arts in a children's book or newspaper. Um, I worked for both in both situations. I'll make it and then uh, it will be pressed by some printer and then um, people get to enjoy it and I won't have anything to do with it. <laughs> like I don't have to actually interact with people. I was very much in the background because I thought this world was so odd um, and I, I could empathize with people so much that for a long time I was afraid to work with people out of fear that I would get sucked into their whatever was going on with them, uh, which is a very old paradigm way of looking at things, <laughs> I think now. Um, I had to, to conquer that. I had to, to uh, gain trust within myself. Um, and I can really see how automatic writing, which I did for about seven years, was the logical thing for me. It felt safe. It was easy no confrontations, you know, um, and once I had more foundational strength in myself and I took bolder and bolder decisions in my life, um, living my own excitement, following threats of excitement that seem really unpredictable and weird to the outside world, my family is like, what are you doing now? And not with, with this job, this is really, <laughs> I keep on pushing it, you know, um, but I'm really really loving life and I can see other people benefit from this as well 
so from writing to speaking the speaking was really scary for me in the beginning i didn't know i could do that another channeler actually um channeled arjun for me who basically told me to my face you're ready to speak you can do this and i would not have believed him um although he told me but i wouldn't <laughs> it wouldn't enter my brain because i just i just I, i wouldn't i could really not imagine why in the world would that be of any uh, value and i th i had arguments like oh there's plenty of other channels in the world uh, with great information why would this add and now i know these answers is like yes every voice does add and there is a, there is something specific about every single person that feels the urge to do anything with channeling in any way shape or form whether it is art or music or dance or speaking or toning <laughs> um i think when the intention is there for you to connect with any kind of higher frequency energy and to bring it through into this world you're a channeler and it's perfect and i know that now i had to live it but i can, i can also see how um I learned so much from being insecure first and being where I am now. I would not recognize myself if this version of me would walk back <laughs> and speak to the like seven years back version of me. I would probably have a hard time believing that I'm doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> and again, it was never on my wish list. I never felt that I, I'm like, okay, I'm happy with this writing and I'm getting beautiful messages out of it for myself. And I like how I can see how things are happening with friends. But I had to overcome this fear of being sucked in, like being really strong in my own energy. And then you can be pure love in the face of the worst disaster without even like shaking. It's, it's possible, but you have to know yourself in these kind of situations first. So I actually worked as a life coach to bridge the idea of artist to channeler. Again, I didn't know I was going to channel, but I did life coaching for about a year, like very short. Um, I studied herbal medicine. Um, I did all kinds of techniques, energy work already in my own life and started sharing it with other people when I became a life coach. I worked with a friend who had cancer um, and I literally, all my fears, I faced all my fears. The, the idea that somebody else that you love might die. Um, I was in a kind of shipwrecking accident, <laughs> all these like, crazy things and everybody was freaking out and I was so calm in the midst of a storm, literally. And I just got to know myself to a degree where at some point I felt really, really steady. And that's when, through this other channel, and I had no idea what was coming, <laughs> uh, Arjun said, you know what, you're so ready, just just open your mouth, just start speaking. Just do it, just do it, because you can, if you want to. Of course, it wasn't an order, it was, it was a suggestion. He said, you're ready now, we're ready. If you are, um, you can experiment with this. And then I started to do that. I actually had some, um, I already had clients, So I picked out the most open-minded ones <laughs> and I said, so it's up for an experiment. Um, I want to practice this idea of channeling and let's see what comes out of it. I had really no expectations. Um, so I, I trial, trial tested <laughs> uh, on some people with this and the energy was so strong and the messages were so clear that... Um, I really, I could, I could of course come up with more reasons to not do it, more like what are you going to tell your family, what are you going to tell the world, your friends, everything. Um, but it wasn't, the love side weighed so much stronger, the, the, the reflections were so positive, I thought I'm just going to do this, I'm just going to do this and I will tell people in my own tempo when I'm ready. Um, and so I did my family in little faces, <laughs> like first this person who you kind of know it's going to be okay with, and then the other person, and then some friends, and eventually Facebook and social media. And um, it also kind of pushed me, of course, to uh, share about my childhood and what I believe these things were. To me, it all makes total sense, but for a lot of people, this 
this was pretty like a big jump. People who didn't know me so well, but they were like more like acquaintances, not so much friends. They were like, what? What is she doing all of a sudden from artist to life coach to this? But to me, it makes total sense. So there was a bit of a journey there. Where can our uh, viewers find out more about you, your website, and where you'll be traveling if they want to come see you in person or book any sessions or anything else that you can share? Yes. Um, so I do private sessions. I do group sessions uh, with Arjun. Uh, he will answer uh, in groups questions. And in private sessions, uh, there's also um, a, a type of session. I call it healing, even though... I believe that we can only heal ourselves and everybody can only heal themselves. Uh, but the team that Arjun works with uh, assists in reflecting to people where certain um, um, things that they're struggling with emotionally, but sometimes also physically, where they originated and how they can bring them back into harmony. So this is kind of what I'm facilitating now for people. I live in the Netherlands, but I do work internationally. Um, my uh, travel agenda is on my website and all the information for the for the sessions as well which is www.designforawareness.com and the four is a number four so that's where people can find me <laughs> well thank you so much for joining me today it's been a pleasure spending some time with you and getting to know you and having our Yun channel for uh speak to us as well and answer some questions uh, we'll be keeping an eye on you and maybe we can have you back on the show later. Thank you so much, Ethan. That would be wonderful. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for all that you are doing for the world because that is huge. I love the platform that you're creating and the bridge that you really are. Um, yes, and uh, it would be lovely to meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Awaken Empower TV with my special guest, We Take a Cool Off. Join me next week as we speak with another incredible individual who's standing on the leading edge and changing the world.